In this video, we're going to do a quick review of the inverse trigonometric functions. Now, none of our uh, trig functions are one to one because they're periodic functions. But if we were to restrict the domain of our uh, trig functions. So for example, if I only looked at the portion of sine of x between negative pi and pi, so this magenta portion right here, well that portion would represent a one-to-one -one function. And the same with the other trig functions. For cosine, we have to choose zero to pi, for example to get a one-to-one -one function. Tangent, we only take one of the branches, the principal branch between negative pi over two and pi over two. For a secant, you actually have some choices. So I'm going to follow the textbook. The textbook chooses to restrict it to this half of the branch between zero and pi over two. And this other half, so we're going to skip this part in the middle and then the other half between pi and 3 pi over 2. So then this is what the graphs would look like of the inverse functions. So we write uh, y equals sine with this superscript minus 1. This is just like the inverse f inverse notation. So this just means inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, and inverse secant. Another word that we use for those inverse functions is we put this word arc in front of it. So arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, and arc secant. They all mean the same thing. In some books there's a slight difference, but in our textbook, arc sine of x is exactly the same as inverse x. Arc tan of x is the same as inverse tangent, and so on. So what does y equals inverse sine of x or y equals arc sine of x mean? It means y is going to be the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is equal to x. So x will equal sine of y. And that's the same idea with all of the functions. So it's going to be the angle whose trig function equals the uh, input is going to equal x in the given restricted domain. Now the arctan function we're going to visit a lot in this class. And so uh, one thing that's really interested about it or interesting about it is that the domain is all real numbers, but its range is bounded between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And it has two horizontal asymptotes. So as you go off to the right, the horizontal asymptote is pi over 2. And as you go to the left, the horizontal asymptote is negative. y equals negative pi over 2. So let's just do some practice with just some numbers. Uh, what is inverse cosine of 1 half? Well, that would be the angle between 0 and pi, whose cosine equals 1 half. And so since cosine of pi over 6 equals 1 half, and pi over 6 is in that range between 0 and pi, then we can say that inverse cosine of 1 half is pi over 6. So remember, these inverse functions have to be 1 to 1. So I can only get one answer. So here I have negative pi over 10. I'm going to take the sine of that. Now remember, with the regular trig functions, I can use any 
number as input for sine and cosine because their domain is all real numbers. So negative pi over 10, no problem. And the key here is that negative pi over 10 is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So whatever sine of negative pi over 10 is, I don't need to calculate its value because I'm going to undo the, the sine right away and I'll get negative pi over 10 back again. Now that might seem obvious to you, but let's look at this next example. Again, I can put negative 5 pi over 3 as input into cosine, and I'll get some number out, which will be a valid input into inverse cosine. But what will I get when I take the inverse cosine of that? Well, one way I could do this would be to just say, well, what is um, cosine of negative 5 pi over 3? Um, cosine negative 5 pi over 3 is going to be uh, 1 half. So I could think of this as just saying, oh, cosine of negative 5 pi over 3 equals 1 half. And then I could then take the inverse cosine of 1 half. But if this were uh, negative, let's just say, uh, 5 pi over, uh, let's make it negative 15 pi over 17. Well, there is no nice expression for negative 15 pi over 17. And using a calculator uh, is going to pose a lot of potential issues. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to recognize that, well, look, how would I even calculate cosine of negative 5 pi over 3? Whether I'm using a calculator or not is say, hmm, well, negative 5 pi over 3, uh, it's not in the range of inverse cosine. So I can't just do the same trick that I did over here. Um, because um, it wouldn't make sense to be able to say that, you know, cosine inverse of something is negative 5 pi over 3. It has to be between 0 and pi. But really... Uh, since cosine is periodic, I can just take negative 5 pi over 3 and add 2 pi. The result is pi over 3. And then cosine of pi over 3 uh, is between, well, sorry, pi over 3 is between 0 and pi. And so I could just look at it like I did with part B and say that the uh, inverse cosine of cosine of negative 5 pi over 3 is the same as the inverse cosine of cosine of pi over 3, which would just be pi over 3. All right, let's look at something which is going to be or going to have a more direct application to a lot of the work we're going to do in this class. We're given an expression involving an inverse trig function and a regular trig function. And we'd like to rewrite this as an expression in terms of x. So the first thing I'll do is I'll recognize that the input to the sign, I'll think of that as theta. And so theta is inverse cosine of x. So cosine of theta equals x. And now what we're going to do is draw a right triangle, which would illustrate cosine of theta equaling x. And the simplest way I could do that is to think of 
x as being x over 1, so adjacent over hypotenuse. So I'll put my angle theta here. I'll make the adjacent equal to x, the hypotenuse equal to 1. And then I need to find this missing length. So I'll use the Pythagorean theorem. And from the Pythagorean theorem, I find that this length could be represented by radical 1 minus x squared. So now, my original expression is the same as sine of theta in this triangle, which would be radical 1 minus x squared over 1. Now, I could have left off the over 1 part, but I just want to emphasize it's opposite over hypotenuse. Let's use the same technique to write an expression in terms of x for cosecant of arctan of 2x. So I'll let this value theta be arctan of 2x. Remember that's inverse tangent, which means that tangent of theta then equals 2x. So from here, I'm going to draw a right triangle, which represents this statement, tangent of theta equals 2x. And so remember tangent, we think of as being opposite over adjacent. So I'll make the opposite 2x. I'll make the adjacent 1. There's my angle theta. I'll have to fill in the missing side of the triangle, which is the hypotenuse. But I'll use the Pythagorean theorem to get radical 1 plus 4x squared. So 1 is 1 squared. The quantity 2x squared gives me 4x squared. Add those together and take the square root. Now, cosecant theta is 1 over sine theta, which means that it would be hypotenuse over opposite in this triangle. And so cosecant of arctan of 2 theta is this cosecant of theta, and the hypotenuse is radical 1 plus 4x squared, and the opposite is 2x. So I'll get this expression, radical 1 plus 4x squared over 2x. And there's no way I can simplify that. I'll just have to leave that in that radical form. So I hope that this refreshed your memory about the inverse trig functions and this triangle technique we're going to be using over and over throughout the class.